Imagine for a moment our planet as one single organism with one single intention, to develop. Imagine the Earth as having a kind of mind as our own, which guides this intention, and all of its parts works to achieve a unified effect. Let's call this effect an evolutionary creative upshift, which can never be an outgrowth of competing chemical processes and interactions working at random, but rather an intention that corresponds to something like our mind. What then, you might ask, is our role in this self-developmental process? Well, considering our Earth exists within a universe filled with all kinds of cosmic radiation, which it's constantly being bombarded by, and since we as humans know very little about what's going on out there due to our inadequacy of the five senses, we must direct our planet's intention, covering Earth with the draperies of extrasensory perception giving it eyes where it can't see, ears where it cannot hear, and feelers where it cannot touch, in order to find the cracks between what's sensed and peek into the reality which lies beyond what's sensed. Although we've not yet put this approach to economic development in practice yet, the framework and policy for achieving this has already been provided by the Russian Science Driver Program, the Strategic Defense of Earth. A defense of Earth means more than just understanding all the many galactic threats to our planet and its inhabitants. It means willfully assisting the planet and ultimately the universe at large in its own creative development. While the framework to achieve this has been provided by the Russians, it's been the LaRouche Pack Basement Research Team that has made major steps in filling out the framework and its implications, effectively putting some meat on that needed policy's bones. We continue that fleshing out process here in this second episode of our series by looking further into the galactic implications of viruses. Last time we used the case of the Elysia chlorotica sea slug to illustrate just how viruses play a role in the development of species as a mediating agent in the evolutionary process we know correlates with larger galactic cycles of 62 million years and 140 million years, both of which are responsible for evolutionary processes and also mass extinctions. That investigation naturally leads to the question, how do these larger changes in the cosmic and electromagnetic environment affect how viruses are expressed on Earth, given that they seem to mediate evolutionary changes? Now this immediately directs our attention to another virus to cosmic radiation relationship the phenomena of seasonal viral epidemics and non-seasonal pandemics, influenza being the subject of this report. Despite much work being done on this subject, it's still completely unknown why the over 200 separate viral infections, referred to as the common cold and the flu, occur on a seasonal cycle. The flu has an as yet unexplained behavior pattern, even though we've become accustomed to it. Every year the flu appears to circle the world, appearing and disappearing with the seasons. Upon every return, the virus has transformed itself enough that it is entirely unrecognizable to our immune systems. Although catching the flu or receiving a vaccination in one year is enough to keep you from catching it again that year, by the next year it's transformed so much that as far as your body is concerned, it's quite a different illness. The off season for the flu in one part of the globe is simply an epidemic season elsewhere in the world. As the Earth orbits the sun, its inclination towards or away from the sun changes on a yearly cycle due to its slight tilt. This tilt causes what we experience as seasons. But when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, our summer, and therefore no flu, the southern hemisphere is tilted away, experiencing their winter. And in fact, genetic analysis of successive flu outbreaks between the southern and northern hemisphere would seem to give an evolutionary cycle for the flu, which seems to oscillate back and forth across the equator. In other respects, though, the flu does not behave as though it's a traveling virus. First of all, in order for a virus to travel, it requires either a host, a sick person, or some sort of vector, like an animal or insect. The spread would then have to move along the traveling routes of whichever host would be carrying it. 
Today, we might expect air traffic across the equator to act as such a vector. But these epidemic patterns have existed long before rapid transit of human beings. In fact, a study by English practitioner Dr. Hope Simpson showed that epidemic patterns for the flu have not changed in Great Britain for over four centuries. So it becomes clear that human travel is not a primary causal factor in the spread of flu viruses. Furthermore, a study of 25 successive flu epidemics in France and the United States showed that not only was the onset of the flu simultaneous in two very different populations, but the peak of the epidemic always occurred within a mean of four days of one another. This would imply that the entire life cycle of the flu, and not just its transmission, is governed by some sort of outside activation. <coughs> It's also significant that none of this depends on running out of potential victims. As we know, not everybody who could catch the flu will catch it before it vanishes. It simply leaves when it's time to leave, not because it ran out of things to do, but it was, in a sense, turned off. Here's another peculiar case to the same point. Laboratory experiments have shown that it's actually incredibly difficult to intentionally infect healthy people with the flu from another person. In 1919, one year after the Spanish flu outbreak, the U.S. Public Health Service tried to infect 100 volunteers from the Navy in order to understand and conquer the virus. They chose infected donors who were in the early stages of infection, then proceeded to transfer the virus obtained from the diseased to the admittedly brave volunteers through mixing a combination of bronchial and nasal mucus from the feverish bedridden patients by directly spraying it into the nostrils, throats, and eyes of the healthy volunteers. In this experiment, contrary to what you might think would happen, none of the healthy volunteers became ill. From this, we might say that the cyclical nature of the flu behaves as though it's ordered by a causal factor that lies outside of any point-to-point -point transmission over long distances dependent on something that lies within the seasonal process itself. While we can't discount all direct sick-to-well infections, Dr. Hope Simpson's principal hypothesis was that epidemic influenza is transmitted when the virus remains latent in those who have suffered influenza and is seasonally reactivated so that influenza is caught from these symptomless carriers, activated by the seasonal stimulus. Now, what should we mean when we use the word season? Well, connected with what we call seasons here on Earth, there's not just the incident solar radiation. There's a broad palette of numerous other changes, invisible to the normal five senses, many of them electromagnetic, which are also related to the sorts of evolutionary transformations discussed earlier. The ionosphere, for example, whose thickness changes depending on which direction the sun is found, also oscillates with the seasons. This change in ionospheric structure changes the shape of the waveguide that it forms with the Earth's surface, thereby changing the structure of the electromagnetic oscillations trapped within this waveguide, magnetic oscillations to which biological processes are extremely sensitive, as we've seen in the cases of birds following the magnetic field to navigate and all sorts of animal freakouts preceding earthquakes. These are the same oscillations on which various biological organisms, including human beings, depend for their sense of time, for example. And even more subtle changes also correspond to what we know as seasons. One is the fact that atomic decay rates change with distance from the sun. This distance from the sun is also something which changes with the seasons. Whatever subtle mechanism may be responsible for this change would likely also have an interesting effect on biological processes, almost impossible to predict with our current state of knowledge. In fact, in the case of the flu, we have a clear correlation between influenza pandemics and epidemics with solar activity and the cosmic ray environment. Flu pandemics are cases of non-seasonal flu. The entire world contracts the flu at the same time. But these global pandemics are still correlated to processes within the sun. In 1978, Dr. Hope Simpson pointed out 
the coincidence between peaks in the sunspot curve when solar activity is at a maximum and the occurrence of influenza pandemics associated with antigenic shifts of the virus. He pointed to five coincidences over the period of 1919 to 1968. This case, looking at a chart of solar activity against the occurrence of pandemic flu, shows a clear preference of outbreaks in periods of successively strong solar maxima. There is also a case of another study conducted by a Chinese researcher, Dr. Yu Dun. He showed evidence that the exceptions to this pattern show a close coincidence with bright supernovae and changes in the cosmic ray environment with influenza, rather than just the sun. He showed that there is a good relationship with novae in the first four influenza pandemics that occurred in the 20th century, beginning with the most powerful 1918 Spanish flu. All of these cosmic events are events which are known to transform the cosmic radiation environment on Earth as a whole. In fact, based on using cosmic ray flux, Jin Dong and his team were able to predict the influenza epidemic of 1984. Today, the sun happens to be going into some sort of lull period, possibly a new maunder minimum. This means that the coming maximum of cycle 24 at the end of this year will be the weakest maximum in the recent decades, a minimum maximum. After that, the sun may not have enough juice to generate another full sunspot cycle for the foreseeable future, possibly decades or even centuries into the future. Meanwhile, the cosmic ray flux is the highest measured since the 1950s. Based on this fact, and the relationship the cosmic environment has with viruses, an implication of the sun's coming hibernation is that our planet and biosphere will become more and more susceptible to the whims of the galaxy without the mediating strength of an active sun, rendering us very vulnerable to the activation of extreme weather, increased seismic activity, and a possible viral pandemic. So, as we've seen, the effects of the cosmic medium on living processes is still highly unknown to us. Even the seasonal common cold and influenza, which we take for granted as coming and going regularly with the seasons, respond to our extraterrestrial radiative environment for their signals of when to activate, when to subside, and when to evolve. The changes in that radiative environment, from our local sun to the larger galactic changes, are highly unknown to us still. These facts should immediately force us to change our perspective here on Earth and force us to shift medical, economic, and political policy to a science-driven mobilization to explore the galaxy more broadly and find out how it actually interacts with our planet, effectively deciphering the cosmic language our galaxy is using to communicate with our planet and maybe even us too. After all, our planet's development is based on its constant communication and interaction with the whole galaxy, which should tell us that if we want to understand our planet even, we have to get to know who it's talking to in the same way that human individuals' development is not severed from the relationship to mankind and society as a whole. So we might want to meet the universe halfway and learn its language so we can take an offensive approach rather than a defensive one and extend the hand of collaboration to our universe for the needed addition of increasing rates of willful creativity as our, mankind's, contribution. Now we can begin that with adopting and developing a program for the strategic defense of Earth. Now, in our next episode, this question of communication and language will be the subject. We'll take up more directly what communication is like in the electromagnetic and cosmic domain, how viruses with no apparent words to communicate do communicate through this domain, and what this domain actually is such that it's an adequate medium through which these biological processes communicate. This will further instruct us to throw off the shackles of simple sense perception and words that represent objects and rather leap into the new but true domain of communication based on the unseen principles that the best poets expose through irony 
and metaphor.